Well, several weeks ago, before the Advent season, we did a series of messages on the value of the church. And then we took a break from that to move into Advent and celebrate the first coming of the Lord. But today we're going to pick up that value of the church series. And before we get into today's message, I want to do just a, a bit of a recap because it's been several weeks. So far, we have recognized that the church is valuable for several reasons, and that's important. Because if we're going to church and we're going to worship simply because of habit, well, that's a good habit. But we need some tangible reasons from the Word of God of the value of the church so that we can give an answer to those who would ask. Why is it so important to you? You know, is it just a, a, a case of religion? Well, those of us who know the Lord Jesus know that Christianity is not really about religion. It's about having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. A very valuable relationship. And so we've discovered from the Word of God that the church is valuable because the church is the temple of God. It's not the sticks and bricks where we gather to worship that is valuable to God, but it's you. It's the people that comprise the body of Christ and that comprise the temple of the Holy Spirit. That God by His Spirit is dwelling within us. The church is valuable because it is the assembly of worshipers. We saw where worship is innate to the human experience. So it's not a matter of whether or not a person is going to worship, but rather, what will you worship? And the church is valuable because the church is the assembly of true worshipers, those who are gathered to worship God in spirit and in truth. The church is valuable because it is the purchased assembly. That if you are a Christian, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That he has purchased the elect from every tribe, every nation, and every tongue by his precious blood. The purchased assembly. The church is valuable because it is the heavenly model where God's kingdom is done on earth, even as it is in heaven. And so that's our prayer. Whether it's a, a healing that we're praying for, whether it's a, you know, a new job that we're praying for, whether it's direction with a major life decision that we're praying about, our prayer is always and forever, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, even as it is in heaven. The church is valuable because it's the victorious army, and aren't you glad you're part of that victorious army today? where God's will is done and we recognize the, uh, the reality of spiritual warfare and we recognize that uh, the primary way spiritual warfare demonstrates itself in the world is through vain imagination and every pretense that rises up in arrogance against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so how do we battle it? We battle it with the truth of God's word, bringing into captivity every imagination and forcing it to surrender itself to the lordship of Jesus Christ, for he is not only Savior, but he is Lord. And then we recognize the value of the church because the church is the fellowship of believers. And how many of you know fellowship goes beyond potlucks and mashed potatoes? <laughs> And yet the fellowship of believers is so critically important. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, the Bible says. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the Lord Jesus Christ, his dear Son. And so this morning we're going to continue on in this series, The Value of the Church, by considering the church as the guardian of truth. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning if you would. As we read the main texts for this morning, they're taken from Ephesians 1.13. John 17:17 17, 17, and 1 Timothy 3:15 The guardian of truth Ephesians 1 and 13 In him you also when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation and believed in him were sealed with the promised holy spirit John 17:17 17, 17, Jesus said Sanctify them in the truth your word is truth and then in 1 Timothy 3.15, God's household is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you today for giving us the privilege, the awesome privilege of coming together as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you 
to lift our voices and our hearts in song, and then, Lord, to be uh, taught from your word. We pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would give us ears to hear and hearts that are open to receive your word. May we hear what the Spirit is saying by the revealed word of God, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. One day, a pastor was walking through the corridors of his church, and it was at that time right between Sunday school and the morning worship hour. And as he was walking along in the, the Sunday school wing there, there was a preschool class. And he noticed a little preschool girl standing there outside of the class. And she had this little book in her hand, which was the story of Jonah. And he thought he'd have some fun. And so he engaged her in conversation and said, what are you doing out here in the hall? And she said, well, you know, the class just got over and I'm waiting for big church. And he said, well, what is that you have in your hand? And she said, well, this is the story of Jonah and the big fish. And the pastor said, well, did you really believe that story? Well, yes, she said, it's in the Bible. Of course I believe it. And he said, well, how can you prove to me that that story is true? And she thought for a moment, and she said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah. The pastor said, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? And the little girl put her hands on her hips and said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> How many of you believe that the truth is important? Just by a show of hands, that the truth is important. And haven't you come to appreciate the truth even more in the midst of a culture that is so confused when it comes to the subject of truth. You know, the truth of the matter is that many in our culture no longer believe in the truth of God's Word. In fact, the sad truth this morning is that the Bible is under attack. Forces in our culture are assaulting the truth of the Scripture. Back in the I think it was 2002, during season two of The West Wing, that drama on television assaulted the truth of God's word. The character, the President Bartlett, played by Martin Sheen, denigrated a conservative talk show host because of her biblical worldview. He then went on to openly mock the Bible and to openly scorn several passages from the Old Testament. Of course, what this message was communicating is only a dim-witted fool would believe in the Bible. On the cover of Rolling Stones magazine of a recent issue, a pop singer was shown as a caricature of Jesus, complete with a crown of thorns. A very popular female pop singer strapped herself to a 20-foot cross and wore a crown of thorns on one of her world tours. In 2012, during the Valentine's episode of the TV musical Glee, the Bible was openly mocked and ridiculed as conservative Christians were run down for holding to traditional Christian values. In 2002, at the National High School Journalism Convention, the guest speaker berated the Bible, referring to it with obscenities. As student Christians who were there quietly got up and began to leave one at a time, he went on to berate them with a barrage of obscenities. And what makes it incredibly ironic is that this conference was for the sake of discussing, of, of discussing bullying. And he bullied the Christians on their way out of that theater. There's an anti-Christian bias even in our military. In 2013, just last year, at the Clinical Pastoral Education Center of San Diego, California, there were two Christians who were being trained to serve as chaplains in the VA hospitals around our nation. They were repeatedly mocked for their belief in the authority of Scripture. They were forbidden to pray in Jesus' name and forbidden to refer to the Scriptures while in the classroom in our military chaplain training center. The forces in our culture are assaulting the truth of Scripture. But what is even more of concern to me is that there are forces within many traditional denominations that are also assaulting the truth of Scripture. I want to say that again. It's not only forces from without 
but even forces within traditional historic denominations that are beginning to question and openly ridicule the authority of Scripture. Many in positions of leadership in these traditional denominations are adopting positions that are patently at odds with that which has been revealed in the Word of God. Attacking the authority and the infallibility of Scripture. And then others are claiming that they have been given a new revelation. That God has spoken to them. And now they have this new revelation that they want to share with the world. They assault the singularity and the sufficiency of Scripture in doing that. The truth of God's Word is under attack by cultural forces that are assaulting the Scripture, by satanic powers that are assailing the Bible, and even some in organized religion that are attacking the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what are we to do? Gee, Pastor Greg, I thought I'd come to church this morning and hear a positive message that would uplift me. <laughs> well, I hope that this does uplift you, but friends, make no mistake, this is a war that we are engaged in. The forces of darkness have aligned themselves against the God of the Bible and against the Scriptures. The Bible says, Woe be unto the inhabitants of the earth, for Satan has been cast down with great wrath, knowing that his time is short. We are living in desperate times. And so it's not time to stick our heads in the sand. Rather, it is a call to arms. We as Christians are called to stand side by side, shoulder to shoulder, to stand on the Word of God and to stand for the Word of God. Can you say amen? The truth of God's word is under attack. How are we to respond to this widespread onslaught against the word of God? Well, quite frankly, we are to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That's what we are to do. We are not to quietly sit by and idly wring our hands or smile as if nothing were going on. We are to ask God for the words that we might speak to testify to the authority, to the inerrancy of the Scriptures, that the Scriptures are sufficient. We're to contend for the faith, to struggle for sound biblical teaching, to oppose false ideologies and what the Bible calls doctrines of demons. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been commissioned as the guardian of the truth the pillar and the foundation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my question this morning is if we as the church of Jesus Christ do not stand for the truth, pray tell who will. We must stand for the truth. We must contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Nothing less is the very commission that the Lord Jesus Christ has given to us. Contending for the faith and for the truth of God's word is not popular. Listen, if you believe in the authority of the scripture, if you believe in the sufficiency of the scripture, if you believe in the infallibility of the scripture, if you believe in, 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 in its inerrancy, you will be scorned, you will be persecuted, and you will be mocked. You may be overpassed for a promotion in the workplace. You may be kept out of all of the private conversations that happen in the office. You may find that when you walk into a room, everyone looks at you and stops talking. Why? Because you are being persecuted for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Peter said, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Amen. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus preaching the famous Sermon on the Mount, he said, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Contending for the faith is not easy. Standing up for the scriptures is no walk in the park. 
count the cost, Jesus said. If we are going to follow him, we must take up our cross daily and follow him. Resisting doctrines of demons will not win you any brownie points in this culture. It's not without effort. And yet God has called his church as the pillar and foundation of the truth. Friends, we are the salt of the earth. We are that city, that shining city that is sitting on a hill. And God has called us to stand on his word and to stand for his word. We're to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints. But notice that we are not struggling against the philosophies of man. We're not contending for ideologies of philosophers or, or resisting for theories of the academicians. We are contending for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is what we are striving to preach. This is the message that the apostles preached and the prophets delivered. It's the message given by God, not devised by man. This message is the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed unto the saints, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the message that we are standing for, and nothing less will do. Friends, if we don't stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are nothing more than a social club. What distinguishes the church of Jesus Christ from every other gathering is the message that we have been given that Jesus saves and Jesus sanctifies and Jesus justifies and Jesus glorifies and Jesus is coming again. That is the message that we've been given. And that is the message that we must contend for. Now is the time for men and women of faith to stand on the Word of God and to stand up for the Word of God. Martin Luther, the great reformer, he said, if I profess with the loudest and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except that little point which the world and the devil are at the moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Him. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefield besides is mere flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. What a powerful statement. Friends, we are called to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The truth of God's word is under assault by the powers of this world, by the forces of darkness, and even by some in traditional denominations. So let the church of God arise from her slumber. Let us take up the truth of God's word, the sword of the Spirit, standing on it and standing for it. It's not popular. Some in our culture will say, well, why can't we just live and let live? I mean, why can't we just, you know, be tolerant of all worldviews? Jesus wasn't. Jesus was not tolerant of any worldview other than his. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Well, who was Jesus to make such a statement? Well, he was only God the Son. <laughs> the Word made manifest among us. The Apostle Paul says, he who literally embodies the fullness of the Godhead, the image of the invisible God, through whom the worlds were formed, that's all. That's all. And he didn't preach a tolerant gospel. He preached, narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that find it. You see, the broad way has a big sign over it that says, this way to heaven. And it's just jam-packed with people. The Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is destruction. It doesn't lead to eternal life. Jesus is the door that we must enter by. Jesus is the way that we must go through. The only way. 
The Bible says one day every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Confucius will declare Jesus is Lord. Mohammed will declare Jesus is Lord. Hira Krishna will declare Jesus is Lord. Satan himself will declare Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But Jesus alone, he alone has the words of eternal life. We must not shy away from our divine call to contend for the faith. For the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. We have the only message of salvation. People don't want to hear this. But the truth is, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says you are abiding under the wrath of God. That the wrath of God abides upon you. But if you know Jesus Christ, then God's fury and God's wrath has been poured out on your sin already 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary. You see, sin has been judged. That's the good news. But the only way that that can be appropriated to your life is by putting, putting your faith in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Praise the Lord. For God sent his Son into the world not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. So how are we saved? By coming to the Lord Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, the life. Our culture has largely turned away from the truth of God's word. And that in and of itself is a sign that we are living in the last days. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Just this very week, I turned on the television and saw a TV preacher who was denying the doctrine of the Trinity. A foundational teaching handed down from the apostles. Part of the body of Christian truth that Jude is referring to as the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Do we fully understand the ramifications of the Trinity? Of course not. To fully understand the ramifications of the Trinity is to make your God small enough to fit in a three pound brain. If you can fully comprehend the eternal God, you don't really know who God is. <laughs> Our God who speaks the word and planets are hurled into their orbits. This last week I saw a video that was on microbiology and it was showing the discoveries that have just made in the last couple of years about what goes on within each and every individual cell of every living organism and it will absolutely blow your mind. That cell is like a factory with innumerable little creatures, little organisms that are highly specialized and each has its own job. There was one that its job was to carry cargo of nutrients into the nucleus of the cell. And it carries those, that cargo along the pathways of the superstructure of that cell, look like gigantic eye beams and this little creature is moving along with legs that are moving along with this huge thing strapped to its back kind of like, you know, taking this cargo into the heart of the, into the nucleus of the cell. It's amazing. They said the only way we could even tell that these were legs moving along was by slowing them down because the thing moves its legs like a hundred times per second. They slow it down and slow it down, slow it down, slow it down. They showed a cell that was under an attack by a virus. 
and each cell has like four different defenses in place. And finally, this virus was able to make it past. I mean, hundreds of other viruses, you know, met their demise, but this one made it through. And when it made it through, it carries its own DNA, which is a whole other discussion. If you don't believe in intelligent design, then you've never studied DNA. What is DNA? It's information, highly encoded information. <laughs> So this virus carries its own DNA into the heart of that nucleus of that cell, and when it does, immediately it takes control of the cell and it begins to multiply itself. But what really blew my mind was when all hope was lost for that little cell, its dying mission was to send word to the other cells of the body. And so it forms this packet of information, this packet of uh, really what remains from some of the dead, uh, dead viruses. And again, you see this little organism carrying this to the surface of the cell. And when it gets to the surface of the cell, then the other cells in the area and the white blood cells that are in the area are alarmed that the cell has died and here is the fingerprint, so to speak, of the virus that is attacking the body. Once that takes place, then the cells in the immediate area begin to die of their own volition to save the organism. Absolutely amazing. As I saw that video, the, the scripture kept, kept coming back to my mind, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully made. I don't know about you, friends. I love Jesus. But I'll tell you, one of the ways that my love is expressed for him is, is, is in a reverential fear of that kind of intellect that can create that kind of life. And it didn't happen by happenstance or circumstance over millions of years. DNA, information, encoded, intelligent design. It's amazing. The hour is late. Many are turning away from the truth because it's not popular. The gospel is being touted in many corners that one time referred to themselves as orthodox as simply one of many different pathways to God. But the scriptures are clear. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That is the gospel. It's the historic Christian message that was delivered once for all to the saints. And so what do we do? Well, there are three charges as guardians of the truth that I want to look at this morning. The first charge, support the truth. Turn to your neighbor and tell them, tell them support the truth. Support the truth. We are, as the church, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Now, when Paul penned these words, he was writing to the church at Ephesus, and they would have immediately picked up on what he was saying. You see... You'll recall from our studies that Ephesus was the home of the temple of Diana, pagan goddess. And her temple was one of the wonders of the ancient world. It had 127 pillars that supported a massive roof structure. And each one of those pillars was donated by a king. And each one of those pillars was laden in gold and precious jewels. They were a testimony to the king that donated them, and, as well as you know, serving their functional purpose of holding up this large roof. And so they understood the importance of pillars being for support. So we are called as pillars to support the truth to safeguard and to support it. Well, how do we do that? I, I believe we begin by simply believing the scriptures. That's, that's the first way you support the truth is by believing the truth. And it begins with the Old Testament. The Old Testament canon that the apostles believed. The Old Testament canon that Jesus believed. And people say, well, you mean even stories like Jonah being swallowed by a big fish? Absolutely. Absolutely. Why? Well, first of all, Paul believed it. When he was testifying before Felix, the governor of Palestine, he said, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets. 
the law and the prophets. It's a reference to the Old Testament canon of Scripture. Paul says, I believe it. I believe it's true. Really? Something like that? You don't believe that that's just fairy tale and legend? Maybe some metaphor trying to make a point? No! It's the truth. It's what happened. It's historical narrative. Jesus himself said to his generation, this generation will receive a sign, and the sign you'll receive is as Jonah was in the belly of a big fish for three days, so the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. So Jesus believed it. The apostles believed it. We too are to believe it. And then you get the skeptics like that television show that I was referring to earlier. And they will bring up passages from the Old Testament and they'll say, well, what about the harsh and irrelevant commands of the Old Testament? Are we really supposed to believe that? What has that got to do with my life? And so they'll, they'll, they'll not pick things like, thou shalt not commit murder. What they'll pick is something like this from Exodus 21. If anyone uncovers a pit or digs one and fails to cover it and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the one who opened the pit must pay the owner for the loss and take the dead animal in exchange. What has that got to do with my life? They will say. Or they'll get a little more personal and they'll quote from Exodus 21 and 17. Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. Teenagers are squirming. <laughs> and they'll quote a passage like that and they'll say, you mean I'm supposed to believe that? I'm supposed to take my kid out and stone my kid because of, you know, that's what the Bible says? Then they'll quote scriptures that talk about an abomination of God being, you know, taking uh, two different kinds of, of material fabric and making a, a garment out of two different kinds of material. How can we do that? You know, how can we eat our beef and take our dairy at the same time when that's against the law? I love cheeseburgers. And they will quote all of these proof texts, verses taken out of context, to support their claim. But what they don't recognize is the more vehement they make their cause, the more they betray an utter ignorance of the Bible and an absolute ignorance of Judaism and Jewish culture. What do you mean? Well, let me elaborate a, mo a moment. You see, we find in the scriptures three categories of law. The first category, moral law. Moral law, that which applies to all mankind at all times. And we think of, you know, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not lie. Bearing false witness and on and on. Moral law. Second category, judicial law. Judicial law. That judicial law was only given to the Jews. It was given to Israel to set them apart from the nations around them. So it never was intended to apply to anyone else. And incidentally, that uh, a moment ago when I shared that piece of judicial law about a, a son or a daughter cursing their father or mother and being put to death. Interesting side note, there's absolutely no historical record of any parent ever carrying through with it. God was demonstrating the seriousness of those things. But so many of these arguments are moot points. And then there is the ceremonial law. And the ceremonial law was regulations for Israel's worship of God. And so it had to do with things of purification and, you know, baptisms and things of that nature before they would go to temple to offer up sacrifice. Never intended for the world at large. And yet people read them out of context and say, see, how can I believe that? Well, you don't understand. It was never written to you. You're not a Jew. You're not living under the Old Testament system. Well, what about the New Testament? Well, the apostles accepted the New Testament writings as Scripture on par with the Old Testament. One example comes from 2 Peter chapter 3. He says, Our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. 
So clearly, he is referring to the Pauline epistles as Scripture. And that there are those who are ignorant, who twist them because they don't understand them, twist them to their own destruction, as they do the other Scriptures. So the first way that we can support the truth is simply by believing the truth. And it's the first responsibility we have as guardians of the truth. And then secondly, preach the word. Support the truth and preach the word. Again, Paul writing to Pastor Timothy in Ephesus. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. This is a serious and sobering charge. I mean, listen again. He says, in the presence of God. And then he gives the charge. In the presence of God, Timothy. In the presence of God. Preach the word. This is the church's primary mission. We are called to testify to the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Called to take this message to the ends of the earth. Jesus told his disciples, he said, Go to Jerusalem and tarry there until you receive power from on high. And then you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. This is our mission. And then Paul invokes the very presence of God to witness this charge. I mean, the picture is like a solicitor before the bench of heaven's court. And Paul is calling upon God's presence to witness this charge that he gives to Timothy. You see, Paul understood what was at stake. And what grieves my heart is that I think that by and large, many places in the Western world, in Western Christendom, have completely lost track of the stakes. They don't really believe that there is a hell to be shunned and a heaven to be gained. They don't really believe that a God of love and mercy would bring judgment upon the world. They really don't believe in the inerrancy and authority of Scripture. But Paul understood the stakes. He recognized that every man, woman, boy, and girl has fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and fallen short of His glory. That before Christ we are without hope and without God in the world by nature, children of wrath. That's what the Bible says. But then it goes on, but God who is rich in mercy because of His great love has justified us by His grace, grace through redemption in Christ Jesus. It's the good news. But you can't get people saved until you help them recognize they're lost. They're lost. It's especially difficult in America where if you make $30,000 a year as your income, whole household family income, if you make $30,000 a year, welcome to the top 1% of the wealthiest people in the world. It's amazing. Amazing. We've been given so much. Blessed beyond belief. And yet we say, well, I, I'm rich. I have need of nothing. But the Word of God says that without Him, we are undone. And that we must turn to Him or we'll be forever lost. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ and Him alone. And so Paul says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus. Preach the Word. Notice that he ramps it up even more. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, the judge of the living and the dead. The Bible tells us that all judgment has been committed to the Son and that it is appointed unto man once to die and after that, the judgment. That we will all stand before His presence, before His glory and give an account of our lives. Jesus spoke of this in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. See, Jesus is not only the Savior of the world, He is the coming King. 
the judge of the living and the dead. And that's good news because I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but our world is coming unraveled at the seams. Wars and conflicts are widespread. Violence is increasing on the earth. Iniquity is swallowing up multitudes. Deception is pervasive as people declare that which is evil good and that which is good evil. There are earthquakes. There are famines in diverse places around our world. Jesus said these are the beginnings of birth pangs. It's like a woman who is in labor and the pain comes. And as the labor progresses, the birth pangs become greater and more frequent. Greater and more frequent. Greater and more frequent. Until what happens? The baby is born. And Jesus refers all of this to the labor cycle, to the delivery cycle. And he says, when you see these things coming to pass, look up and lift up your head for your redemption draws nigh. The day is coming when Jesus, the Savior of the world, the judge of the living and the dead will come as the returning king. And I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to that day. You see, we've heard the sound of conflict. We've heard the sound of violence. We've heard the sound of death. We've heard the sound of devastation. But we have also heard the wonderful sound. We've heard the joyful news. Jesus saves. Jesus sanctifies. Jesus glorifies. Jesus justifies. And Jesus is coming again. One day soon, I believe with every fiber of my being, we're going to hear another sound. We're going to hear a shout and we're going to hear a trumpet. For the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Praise God. That is the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let every man be a liar, but let God's word be true. Heaven and earth might, will pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Can you say amen? amen. It has been firmly established. That which he has declared shall come to pass. So friends, don't turn tail and run. Don't stick your head in the sand. Build your life on the Word of God and stand up for the Word of God. Can you say amen? amen? Three charges as guardians of the truth. Support the truth. Preach the Word. Number three, contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. Again, Jude 3 and 4. Contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ our only sovereign and Lord. We live in a time when it's fashionable to question and outright deny the sufficiency of Scripture. But this is the faith once for all entrusted to the saints. One time for all time. You see, when Revelation was written, the canon was closed. It was closed. You say, yeah, but I want to hear God's voice. Well, then open the Bible and read. <laughs> he has spoken. He has given His revelation to us. And if we will read and hide His word in our hearts, His Spirit will direct our paths as we trust Him. In Acts chapter 20, Paul said that he had proclaimed the whole counsel of God. In 2 Peter, Peter said that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Here's the question. If we have been given the whole counsel of God, if we have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness, then what else is there? And yet there are those in our culture that are pretending to say, I have new revelation. I have a new revelation from God. Joseph Smith said, I have a new revelation. He, he wrote the Book of Mormon. The Jehovah's Witnesses said, well, I have a new revelation, and they gave the world the New World Translation. 
<laughs> Muhammad said, I have a new revelation. And he gave the world the Quran. But friends, these are not new revelations from God. They are doctrines of demons. They attack the sufficiency of Scripture. They attack the authority of Scripture. And our response to them must be contend for the faith. Don't accept them. Don't say that's another testament. It is not. They are doctrines of demons. And we are to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. One time for all time. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The Word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints from marrow. It judges the thoughts and the very attitudes of the heart. Paul was proud of the gospel, not ashamed of it, because he knew what the stakes were. And in Romans chapter 1, he said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. We must contend for the faith. We must remind ourselves that the stakes are too high to back paddle or be silent. We must recognize that every day, people around this planet slip into a Christless eternity. And the stakes are literally the eternal destination of men and women. Those are the stakes. So what will we do? May we be guardians of the truth. May we support the truth. May we preach the word. And may we contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the precious truth that we have been given. Truth that carries us through difficulties and confusion. Truth that provides a rock bed upon which we may build our lives. Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice today. I ask God that you will give us faith to believe. I ask, Father, for those that don't know you, that today you would give them the gift of repentance. You would give them the gift of faith. And that you would cause them by the power of your Holy Spirit to come to that place where the truth breaks, breaks into, their, into their spirit, into their understanding, and they believe on Jesus Christ. Father, for those that have served you for all of these years, I pray that you would strengthen us in the inner man, that we might stand on the word and stand for the truth. Help us, Lord, to speak the truth with love, Help us to be patient and gracious. But yet, Lord, help us also to recognize that if we compromise the truth, that that is not an act of love, it is an act of cowardice. Help us to recognize that if we truly love people, then we will be willing to gently share with them the Word of God, the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray all of these things for the glory of God in Jesus' name.